really our first our first rollout. Uh, but in the next, I'm going to try and go quickly, but I know this is not going to take this is going to take me longer than 15 minutes. I want to talk about what we're trying to do with FathomNet longer term. So the idea is we'll have FathomNet version 1.0 in 2023. And the idea, hopefully, is that FathomNet and ModelZoo will grow with data and contributions from you all, as well as other people you talk to, uh, you know, hopefully around the world. Uh, what we want to do, though, next is establish uh, a FathomNet working group. So individuals outside of our core group who can give us feedback, really, you know, hold us accountable to for trying to make sure that we're building something that the community can use. And then I think most importantly, too, is a community network. So I, from these conversations, it's really clear, you know, we need an educator network, an enthusiast network, a programmer network and a taxonomy network, right? Because as we're building out FathomNet, getting that contribution or that input from communities are going to be hugely important. Um, we also hope that FathomNet becomes a useful resource for education, training, and capacity building, besides also being a, a great resource for underwater labeled data. Again, this won't happen without community contributions. And then what we're going to try and do is really actively engage with the data science and computer vision communities by hosting challenges um, like Kaggle competitions or hackathons, you know, to really promote that, that interaction. And I just wanted to give you guys a summary of the, the workshop um, where we've had more than, we had 448 registrants. We had 246 attendees on day one. And I just wanted you to know that we've had this little bet going on amongst our team members about how many people would show up. And uh, I may have won or we may have all lost but uh, I think we're all really astonished that um, you know you all made the time and, and came out and, and, and joined us. So we did get 224 respondents for the survey that was shared before the workshop. And the, bre the breakdowns are really help helpful because it helped us organize and plan for these breakout sessions. Uh, and what I am really excited by is the fact that we had uh, individuals representing 35 different countries as part of our first ever FathomNet workshop. And so we're hoping to do many more of these. And so if, if there's an area or region you think we should be speaking to and engaging with, we're happy to do that. But of course, the recording, we will have the recordings available. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight too, and this is, I don't know if this is only a US problem, uh, but in the US, we had 28 states uh, participate and you'll notice this this major gap in the middle. Uh, so I don't know if this is a trend in other countries uh, with and without a coastline. And I've always heard that the ocean community has had a difficult time reaching inland areas. And you know, I, I you know I'm asking this question why, right? And and my background is actually in aerospace engineering. And so I've heard these common comparisons with space, right? How, you know, you have to be near the ocean to be inspired by it. And you compare that with space, you could just look up at the stars and instantly feel connected to space. And, you know, I argue, why? Like, why is that connection so much more surreal or engaging for a community? Uh, like, do you know what we have in the ocean that they, they actually don't have in space? That is life. <laughs> And I, you know, I, I have arguments all the time with my friends who are still in the aerospace industry, like how is that search for life going? But the point is, you know, we don't have just any life. We have weird and wacky, awe-inspiring life that are simply wonderful to observe and study. And so you might ask me then why or how can life be all that engaging? And I'm going to respond with a question, like, did you know that one of the most engaging platforms, uh, public platforms, is based not only on looking for life, but looking for life that is completely made up. Um, and the video game is called Pokemon Go. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you must have been living in a cave because at its peak in 2016, there were 233 million players that played that game. Uh, maybe you vaguely remember people wandering around your neighborhood that you've never seen before, and they probably lived like three houses down. They were holding their phone, kind of looking at it while wandering. So it's these people that were playing this video game looking for fake animals. Uh, this particular game surpassed 1 billion downloads in 2019, and the game made $1.23 billion in revenue. So think about how much science that kind of money could actually achieve. And 
you know, I hear also people say, well, you know, the ocean isn't engaging. Well, that's not really true. In fact, there are plenty of examples of successful video games based on the ocean, like Subnautica, uh, Beyond Blue, uh, Abzu. I mean, this is only a subset, and there's many, many other games coming up. And so what we're trying to think about as we move forward is when we're, we're thinking about trying to develop a pipeline for visual data in the ocean, but trying to bake in engagement because there's no way, you know, only us, our small group of a taxonomist or small group of educators or whatever can get this work done. And so the idea is that we can build a, a visual data pipeline starting from the annotation tools, the artificial intelligence, uh, data science and imaging work that our community currently has, and really expand that with input from the human commuter and human AI interactions communities, as well as the data visualization and game design communities. And so we pitched this idea to the National Science Foundation, and it was funded as part of their Convergence Accelerator program. And so the idea is that if we can combine all this expertise, we can then usher in a future, right, where we can generate visual uh, labels for visual data that can then go back to users and stakeholders, or in, in this case, inform the blue economy, which was the program that we were involved in. Um, and so we'd, we've done, as a part of this NSF funded project, use inspired interviews uh, to try and talk to people within academic industry, governments, NGOs, uh, data, cyber infrastructure groups, education, engagement, uh, enthusiasts, as well as analogous uh, folks. So it's people outside of the ocean, but also thinking about these problems with engagement. And we talked to 38 different users, or had 38 user interviews, and we had more than 35 participants in game development workshops and activities. With this particular workshop, obviously we're gonna bump up those numbers pretty significantly. And this is what we found, was that we found five consistent themes from our user interviews. And the first one is that, that there's a lack of collaboration. Uh, and we need to think global and be collaborative if we want to scale our observational capacity of marine life across the ocean. Uh, there's also a lack of accessible tools. A lot of tooling exists for domain experts, but many groups who need AI don't have the expertise to make it work. So there's a need for flexible and robust data work, workflows for users of all experience levels. There's also a clear lack of AI knowledge within the community. And many people believe that AI works out of the box and that this is simply not true. You know, and what we want to do is try to educate users on the limits and capabilities of AI. Um, interviewees also identified a number of use cases for AI, uh, you know, including processing terabytes of data this is a daunting task. However, AI could be used to speed up the process. And then broader, broad data use cases were identified. Uh, visual data can have many uses uh, that um, you know, is very clear. But enthusiasts told us that if we made them available, they could be assisting more. So in all, these interviews provided useful information and potential user groups and filled gaps in our understanding and illuminated surprising user needs. And so based on these interviews and all of these discussions and thinking like longer term, how do we how do we do this? We should probably be thinking about FathomNet not just as this database, but potentially have it become a global network for ocean life discovery. And, and there are other groups that have thought about this in other uh, contexts or analogous groups. And I know in some of the comments uh, in, the, in the poll yesterday, somebody brought up iNaturalist. And I wanted to talk about iNaturalist and eBird. So these are systems that currently exist. For instance, iNaturalist is a project between Cal Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. They have more than 5 million people signed up. And the way it works is that people can contribute their, their images, share their images with fellow naturalists, and then discuss and collaborate uh, with their findings. Now, the quality of data in this database is suspect. Um, expert labeled classifications actually occur when two people agree on a classification. And based on our taxonomy discussions today, unfortunately, that might not be enough. And most imagery there in that database is iconic. So there's fewer non-iconic imagery. So that means that it, the data there is used more for classification, less so for object detection, but I know that's starting to change. And what's important here too is iNaturalist is leveraging an already existing naturalist community where engagement is through contributing your own imagery as well as providing classifications. 
And I think something that we want to build is probably closer to eBird. Uh, so eBird is a curated data set for Cornell Lab Ornithology. Users can submit their sightings um, and share them or, or track your life list. And what's interesting is that this, this database is curated by a trusted group of birders, not necessarily professionals. And they do this by a regional node a network of experts. And what they're doing though, that's so different from what we're trying to do is that it leverages an existing massive, sometimes obsessive community. And so we have to think about what community aggregator do we currently have for ocean life? Crickets. So there's not a lot of general public knowledge about life in the ocean, unfortunately. So like if you talk to somebody on the sidewalk and ask them to tell the difference between a salp, a siphonophore, a coral or a sponge, they can't do it. So basic understanding of marine life does not exist in the general populace. And so we need to build capacity by developing robust networks of contributors. So we've identified, you know, enthusiasts, educators, programmers, taxonomists, um, but for it to be global, right, if we want to grow the field through demand for taxonomic expertise with the growth of marine imaging for biological observations, we also need to start building out these networks, these regional nodes, um, you know, filled with individuals that have this, this area of expertise. And because most of the ocean is challenging to access, we can't just rely on enthusiasts taking imagery and submitting it to FathomNet. And, you know, that could help in, in coastal regions where there's some access. But what we have to do is really marry the research community with the enthusiast community. So how do we create engagement when the ocean and its life is so difficult to access? And frankly, annotating existing data or data that you didn't have anything to do with creating isn't that engaging by itself. But the carrot that we have that all of these other communities don't have is that individuals can help us participate and discover new life. So play a role in that discovery pipeline and be included with a team of scientists, list of authors describing the animal or play a role in naming the animal. And so thinking about that, and, and really we're thinking about this as a third party service, like not everybody has to buy into all of the tooling that we're trying to create. But what is important is that there's a data infrastructure in place where visual data can come in, um, models or can be deployed and generate predictions. And then this feedback loop continues occurring with humans evaluating the AI data and then getting annotated data out. But what we're really focusing on now is the human AI interfaces. So how do you engage enthusiasts all the way up to experts? And so what we've done is at least kind of subdivided the problem into different specific interfaces. And so just so you know, the Fathomit database really is what we hope will capture that the expert community, you know, trying to ensure that the data that are in the database um, is correct, is accurate, because these algorithms will only perform well if the data is of high quality. So the portal concept would be based actually on the back end of Tater. And the idea is you can upload data there, interact with the data, uh, different models, et cetera. But the concept that we're really, um, what's really new to our group though, is this video gaming one. And there's a lot of ideas behind gamification, game development that can actually be incorporated into all of these other interfaces. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do with video games. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so the first thing is we are uh, now collaborating with Internet of Elephants uh, led by Gautam Shah. So they are based out of Kenya and their background is, is generating data interactions with uh, camera trap data. And what they've already done so far is they're building out different data interactions uh, that allow us to really quickly evaluate or correct annotations generated by a, a machine. And so the idea is that if you can have these modules or these interactions really well uh, defined, you can then in integrate these interactions in different platforms, you know, for instance, like a multi-platform video game. And we've been talking with the creators of Beyond Blue to do this. But the other thing that we're also thinking about um, is how do we integrate this at aquariums or in museums that might have visual displays? So this is uh, one at the Monterey Bay Aquarium at their deep sea exhibit. Uh, I think that opens next week. But the idea is that we could have these kind of data interactions where people, you know, based on what they learned at the aquarium or with some preliminary information, we can actually give them enough information to help verify even high level hierarchy or taxonomic IDs. But why on earth would we want to spend all this time and energy, right, to, to, to engage with more people? Uh, and 
I mean, I, I think that's a basic question and I, I think it's pretty obvious, uh, but really let's, let's, let's look at this image again, right? 7% of the ocean surface area is covered by long-term biological observations. How on earth are we going to get from there to here? And really the only way that we're gonna be able to do that as a community is, is to really think creatively and change the way or the approach that we've been taking with observing life in the ocean. And that's going to take a Herculean effort of a lot of different individuals, including enthusiasts to help make that happen. Uh, so with that, that's kind of what we're hoping FathomNet will become a, a network for ocean life discovery. And of course, it will not be successful without the input of, of the community here. So with that, I am happy to take any final questions. Um, that's where we're going. Thanks, Connie. Well, we're out of time, so I don't think we have time for questions, but we do have all the links to notes and everything for your um, breakout groups are there, they will continue to be open. So you should be able to continue to add questions, comments to those. We'll be um, aggregating everything over coming weeks. Look out for a survey next week, um, which will allow you to again, provide additional feedback um, and continue for us to be in touch with you and to grow this community. So thank you everyone so much for coming and hanging in there through two days of FathomNet workshop. We really, really appreciate you being here and look forward to the future of FathomNet. Thanks, everyone. And I should add, if you want to keep cool. discussing things with us, we will. We have a um, what is it called? Gather, a gather town. town. Sorry, forgot to mention that. <laughs> a gather town link, and um, I know the Fathomet team will hop over there. So I, I, I know there's a lot of comments and suggestions, and we can keep talking about that there. I just put the gather town in the chat, and it's quickly scrolling away. So click on it really quick. It's in the agenda. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.